So we're showing how you get Microsoft server licenses and the downloads so that you can create a Microsoft virtual machine that does run Office 365, including Access, but it also runs other software that you, know, you can't run on a Mac or on a Linux machine. And once you use the campus portal here to access software, Microsoft software downloads, remember you have to enter your email address when you first enter this screen. It's going to redirect you to back to the campus where you enter your 9000 number, your student ID number, and here you are, this is the opening screen. If you go to software, what you'll notice is that developers tools, there's a couple of really cool things in here. One is that you're, you, everybody has access to Visual Studio. So you can download a commercial development um, application. You can also download um, SQL Server developer, which has all of the full scale stuff that that database development environment has. But most importantly, you have access to server 2019 and server 2000 standard. What are we saying? This operating system is like Windows 10 on steroids. It is the commercial server version of the operating system. You click on this and then you click to view the key. And what you want to do is capture your product key. You want to right click that and copy it. Or you click this little thing to copy it. Now it's in the clipboard. You're going to do this. Everybody's code is different. You're going to paste it in a notepad so you don't, you don't lose it or forget it. And then when you're finished with that, you're going to click download. And that's going to download the installation image. It's about four gigs large, twice as large as the Ubuntu. Um, but smaller than the virtual machine download. And that's going to download separately. It's an ISO file, an ISO file. And that's what you use to create a virtual machine. It's like creating the virtual machine you did with Ubuntu or with the PG book, except that um, you step through a couple of options a little differently. Oh yeah, I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna talk about the sliver button in the lower right corner sometimes when I'm coaching you on one-on-one one -on -one walkthroughs, I'll say, hey, close all your windows at once because you have 57 windows open. If you hit this one button in the lower right corner, can everybody see me moving my mouse around here? Okay, right, lower right corner. Yeah? Hello? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, barely legible, just off to the right. Very sliver, if I hit that, boom, everything's closed, everything's minimized instantly. Woo! Okay. Um, in VirtualBox, what you're going to do is create a 30, well, if you want to do it right, 40 gig partition, if you have 40 gigs. If you don't, and you're stretching it, and you can't use, if you find out, oh, I can't use the PG book thing, I can't use Ubuntu, you can, um, you can delete the stuff you can't work with to make some more room, but what you're going to do is create using the ISO installation image. You're going to create a new virtual machine and you're going to call it Windows Server or Win Server, right? And uh, if you've already set up a temporary folder for your machine folder, one thing you want to do is make sure you have a local directory on your Mac or on your Windows machine. You don't want to accept the default if it parks in your, in your My Documents folder. So we've met, I think we've mentioned this before. If you have a My Documents, the default for VirtualBox is that it stores it in your My Documents. For certain versions of Windows or Macs, it, that means the back end of that is in OneDrive or iCloud or Google Drive, whatever. Point is, is that it's online. It's terribly slow. You want to change the, it is Microsoft Windows that we're going to set up, but you want to change this and select Windows 2019 64-bit. And I have a temp folder on my C drive. I've opened up my C drive. 
I've created a temp folder and inside here I have a VM folder where I put my VM machines. Any questions so far? Yeah, basically the same could be done using VMware Fusion, right? We yes. necessarily have to use virtual box. Yes, that's an excellent point. If you have VMware Fusion and it's already percolating nicely, um, VMware Fusion tends to be more stable on a Mac. And it should work very nicely with server because VMware has a commercial interest where VirtualBox doesn't give a darn about Windows or Linux or anybody. It, they just want, hey, they're the flavor of the month. They want everybody to use them. They'll just get along with everybody. Uh, there's some trade-offs and it isn't quite as stable. VMware has a vested interest in the Windows market. So yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up, thank you. So you're gonna click next and uh, you're going to want your Windows server machine to have at least four gigs of RAM. So you're gonna put in 4096 and then you're gonna hit next. You're gonna create a virtual hard disk now. You're gonna to wanna to accept the default VDI virtual disk image. It's not gonna be a dynamically allocated disk. It's gonna be a fixed size. That's important because your virtual machine won't run well if you use dynamically allocated. And you didn't have to do this if you installed the appliance, the OVA file for the PG book because all this was done in the background. Nobody had to follow through this. So we're gonna hit fix size and hit next. You see here I have a 50 gig, that's the default. You need a minimum of 40 gigs to install your server. I'm gonna pretend that I have, uh, well, I, I can put 40 here. Uh, if I hit create, it's gonna create a whole new 40 gigabyte uh, VDI virtual hard disk. I don't wanna do that now in the interest of time. Instead, I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna pretend like, or it's gonna run, it's gonna create that. Then I'm gonna have what amounts to this. Now you're gonna see a screen. Yours would say win server if you're following along. This one says 2019 standard edition. You're gonna go into settings and you're gonna make some quick changes before you start. Similar to the ones we've been walking through for the other virtual machine. If there's a floppy disk that's checked, you're gonna uncheck it because we don't use floppy disks. Ooh, yeah. You're gonna go into processor and you're gonna give it two processors when it's first installing because you want it to go faster, right? After it's installed and set up, you can drop it back down to one. And the display, if you can increase the video memory you do, you wanna check the box for enable 3D acceleration because it's a Windows machine that does that. And then in network, you wanna select bridged adapter instead of the NAT that's normally there. I'm gonna say bridged. And what about storage? Well, in storage, what you wanna do is click the empty disk tray, and then you wanna click this option to the right of it to select the Windows Server Standard 2019 disk file, which also ends in ISO. Instead of Ubuntu ISO, it's Windows ISO, right? It's that, that funkly named one. And and uh, then, then you, after you select that and you say, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna say okay, but cause that's Ubuntu. I don't want it to boot from that. Basically you should be good to go. Um, one other thing you wanna check on your system settings before you start it is that uh, the boot order, you want the optical disc to be up and checked. And in VMware, surprise, surprise, you have to check a box to connect it. You know what I'm talking about? Um, for those of you that have been working with VMware on a Mac, you're probably cringing right now. This stuff doesn't even load or install if you don't do that, but you, you have to open up the devices in VMware Play. And then you have to select the box to connect the DVD drive to the virtual machine. So even if you set up the ISO in VMware, it doesn't work and it doesn't boot from that because it's not connected. 
same as this. If you don't check the box, include it in the boot order and move it to the top, your ISO, your imaginary or virtual disk, your DVD disk, the image file, it doesn't start the machine first. Your hard disk starts the machine, except there's nothing in the hard disk, and then you get an error. Um, that's what you're gonna do. At that point, you're gonna walk through there. It's gonna ask you to set up. You're just gonna accept all the faults and load it, and then it'll run. Once you run your server, you can install Chrome. Or you can, well, yeah, Chrome is probably best. Google Chrome on your server because you want to be able to navigate to the campus. Why do you want to be able to navigate to the campus and why do you need Chrome? The default browser that's installed in server 2019, don't ask me why Microsoft does this. It's Internet Explorer and it's uh, several versions old and it's not very secure and you don't want to do that. And it doesn't always behave like it's supposed to. So you want to install a browser. Ordinarily you wouldn't run a browser from a server, but in this case, unless you want to go to Office Max and spend a hundred bucks for your own Windows 10 disk, and who wants to do that? so they can load free access software. Um, nobody wants to do that. You, you really have a more stable and more predictable platform running from here because it's still Windows. It's just Windows on steroids. So you're actually gonna have a very, very nice uh, scientific computing application platform on the Windows side of things when you would prefer to work in a GUI in a graphical environment, you like drag and drop, you want to use a GUI. You don't want to work in the character environment. Uh, you don't like the terminal in, an, in a Linux system. Uh, when you have a preference, this is a good, good option. That's what Mac users can do. But it's also what Windows 10 users can do if they're getting squirrely results on their laptop. If your laptop is infected, if it's slow, if it's messed up, Okay, um, that's bad, but if you set up a virtual machine on your laptop, once the virtual machine is running, even if it takes a while to load, it's more stable and it works more predictably and it's quicker. Are there any questions about uh, setting up for our, our uh, Mac or other users with Server 2019? How do you log in? Can everybody see this screen? Yeah, I can see. So let's try to move this. All right, so how do I enter control alt delete? I go to input keyboard control alt delete. When you're setting up the server software, when it's first loading, it's going to ask you to give it a password for the administrator want to make sure you know what it is. Okay, that's embarrassing. Oh, let's try another one. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Oh, all right. Well, so you get in there because uh, you don't forget your password like I just did. <laughs> uh, I got to look it up. I probably changed my standard password. Yeah, I'll have to look it up. You get inside, uh, you can browse the web you use Internet Explorer to browse to Google to load Chrome. And then from there, you go into the My Campus portal and install your access. So we're back out to here again. You're going to get into the My Campus portal. You'll go into Office 365 using your server screen. You're gonna download Office 365 
and then it'll install Office, including access on your server. Any questions from our Mac users? Any questions at all? So have we reviewed file systems and file system objects yet? Have we done that in this class? I don't think so. All right. Yeah, at some point we cover that. Let's do that now. So when we're, because we're working inside here, we have uh, a command line interface. Part of this module includes learning some things. We're talking about a path. You have to be able to issue commands to work with a path. So what do we mean by path? And then we're talking about directories. Let's, let's provide a quick primer on file systems, okay? So can everybody see the screen? I know it's kind of small. Yeah. Okay. So we have this idea of a file system and in order to run applications, scientific computing applications and to work the different commands and utilities, you have to be able to navigate up and down the directories and basically uh, in Windows, you have a drive letter with the drive. And so um, your hard drive usually has a drive letter. Most people know this. Um, I've changed the view. So I go to this PC and I go to view and I make sure these two boxes are checked, hidden items and file name extensions. I uncheck item check boxes because if you use Windows 10, and you get into this screen and you have to have check boxes to select that's kind of, well, it's not as efficient. So I would suggest that you uncheck that box and try it for a while. The other thing you wanna do is go to options and you want to change the folder and search options with your selection on this PC. And that's gonna open up a separate window. If you go to the view tab, what you wanna do is unselect the first box and then select all the others and then make sure this is selected, this radio button is selected, and the remaining three boxes are unchecked. And then you're gonna, if you change a setting, like if I change a setting here, and I change it back, I'm gonna say apply, that's gonna apply those setting changes to everything in the C drive. Now, why does that matter? If I double click on the C drive, now it shows up here. And what I really have, if I click there, is the C colon drive letter, that's the first part of the path, which drive it's in. And then you have a single directory that's called root. It's the beginning of the file system. It's the, for lack of a better term, grandparent directory of all the parent directories. So if I look inside the root of the C drive, I see all of these if, if I want to call the C, C drive backslash my parent directory, it works the same in Linux. Everything's a file in Linux, except instead of the backslash, the Linux file system starts with forward slashes root. What happens is that if I go into the directories, the parent, so if this is grandchild, no, I'm sorry, if this is grandparent, the root is considered like your grandparent, the original, the legacy, right? old school. Then you have parent directories. And in my case, the operating system is for Windows is stored in the hello, the Windows directory. So if I go inside there, I'm going to see more directories. Now I'm in the Windows. Now, for, for relative purposes, I want you to understand this. We said that the backslash was the grandparent directory or the legacy directory or as high as you can go in the file system. Windows would be considered a parent directory. Now, what, what is a parent relative to a grandparent? If you have a parent relative to a grandparent, what else could you call that parent? A child. 
Does everybody get the idea that a parent is also a child if there's a grandparent in the picture? It's kind of relative, isn't it? We're going to make a point about that in just a minute. You have things called a relative path, and then you have things called an absolute path. So the absolute path always includes the root. Always down in Windows, always the drive letter and the, and the root, the backslash, and then anything else down to the level you need to work. And when you're issuing commands, a lot of times it doesn't work because you're not in the right parent or child directory. So if this is grandchild, uh, this is grandparent, and this is a, an example of a parent folder. If I go into system 32 right here, where the operating system lives in Windows, now that's the child of the parent. Does everybody see what I'm saying here? So in terms of terminology, and let's say I have a command prompt, uh, like in Windows, I have a command prompt. So I'm gonna open up my command prompt and I'm gonna run it in administrative mode, run as administrator, because otherwise half the permissions don't work. Can everybody see my command prompt? Yeah. <laughs> so notice the similarity here. I'm in the system 32 folder. I opened a command prompt and it's in the Windows parent directory or folder. And then that's in the grandparent, the, the root folder, right? And so if I change this, like if I go into here, okay, now I'm in the temp folder. Let's say I need something in the temp folder. I'm working with system internals, right? Which is a troubleshooting utilities thing, all right? And uh, let's say that I'm in, let's pretend we're in Linux. We don't have a GUI and we have to issue some commands. I'm, my, my command prompt or terminal, my command line interface, CLI, right? Same thing. I'm sitting in this parent and child directory. If I issue the command auto run 64 or cache set, if I'm trying to run some utilities, scientific computing applications, it's going to return and say, oh, I don't know what that is. It's not in here. Command not found. That's because in the system, I'm not in the system 32 folder, right? If I want to run this, I have to include the full path. So let's pick one. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick cache set.exe. That's a good one, right? So I'm going to pretend I want to run cache set exe. I should be able to just run this, right? I mean, after all, I have, oh, I don't know what that is, right? I hit my up arrow key. That's another trick. If you hit your up arrow key, it repeats the last command. I'm going to add exe. Oh, it still doesn't know what it is. So what's the problem? I have a command prompt that's administrative privilege. Or in Linux, I have the pound prompt. That's the same thing. It's, it's elevated privileges. I should be able to execute anything I want. It, the, this executable, this program is not in the path, Windows System 32. Up here, it's, we know it's in Windows Temp System Internals. Now, why am I showing you this? It, you can work between GUI and terminal or GUI and command prompt, and I would advise that just to make your life easy instead of having to do this manually and type it out manually, because if you make a single mistake with any of the characters, it doesn't work, and that's frustrating as heck. But what I'd rather have you do is come up here in the GUI and then click to the right, not on one of these, because then it'll go into that directory. Don't click on this or that or the other, but come to the right of it and just click in the empty space to the right. And now it converts into the path. So why is that significant? Well, I can copy that. I can right click that and copy it. I can go back into here. And let's do this again. I'm going to right click with my mouse button in the administrator command prompt. And I think in the terminal for some Linux distributions, if you right click, it'll paste whatever you had copied. Now I'm going to add a backslash 
because I need to separate the sysinternals child directory from the command, and I'm going to issue cache set .exe. Now, what I'm doing is including the full path of directories from root to that command. And that's what you have to do in Linux a lot for things to work. And that's a pain. But I'm showing you this because I want you to be aware. If you get, it happens in Windows too. If you get a return that says, hey, I don't recognize this. It's not here. It's not a command. You're like, I know it's a command. I'm looking right at it. You're not in the right path. So what you're going to do instead is hit enter. And when you hit enter, uh, it's going to run. It'll come up eventually. And now this particular utility kind of runs in the background and then it, something pops up and then there's a report. And so you see it's blinking, it's still thinking, it's still running. But what I don't have is the, hey, it's not a recognized, uh, this is not recognized as an internal or external command. I don't have that error. Now it's doing something, it's actually working. The same thing is true within Linux. Now, what happens in Linux is that sometimes you're only dealing with part of the path, not the full path to the root, but part of the path. Now, what am I saying? Um, I'm going to go ahead and minimize this. So I'm going to open up a new terminal. Or command prompt if you're in Windows. I'm going to have another, a whole new command prompt, right? So, uh, Let's pretend that uh, I'm in Windows. So I'm going to use the CD space dot dot. A lot of these commands work in similar ways in Linux. That's going to roll me back up the path to Windows. It's going to take me out of System32. And now you see it just shows Windows. If I do CD, if I do CD space System32, it takes me back into Windows System 32. So I've moved from the child to the parent. I was in Windows. And now I'm like, I use change directory. And I said System 32. Now here's the weird part. I'm in Windows. So it's looking for a directory called System 32 inside the Windows parent directory. If I do the same thing from the root CD system 32, that's only part of the path, the file path, the directory path. I'm not going to be able to issue this command. So I'm going to demonstrate that for you. I'm going to go CD backslash. I'm going to go to root. And now I want to change directory into system 32. So I'm going to go such, I go system 32. What? I know there's a system 32. Okay, I must have forgot the backslash. CD backslash system 32. No, that's because system 32 is a, it's part of, a, it's, it's one directory, it's only part of the path, we would call that a relative path statement, right? If I want to go there, I have to get into um, Windows first and then go into System32. But I can go directly there. I can go CD backslash Windows backslash System32. And because I've used the full path with the parent and the child directory, now the command works and I can get there. Are there any questions about relative paths, absolute paths? Always better to use the absolute path, the full path, right? Any questions about being able to 
copy and paste between the GUI environment, right? I don't wanna have to, I can get into some weeds here. If I get into here and then I go into temp and then I get into NAND to Tetris and I get into tools, I'm like, oh, and I gotta issue a command to make something work in a scientific computing application. I'm like, uh, I'm not a computer science major. No, you don't have to be. Just click up here and then right click and then copy. And then take the direct light from wherever you are to wherever you need to be. CD space, copy and paste. And then hit enter. And there you are. Okay, so what we reviewed today was uh, how to jumpstart a Windows virtual machine and some basics about path. And that's important in order for the commands that you're going to be learning as you review chapter two and the study guide. You wanna do that. Did we mention man? I just wanna take a moment to mention man yet. We did that, right? Oh, uh, I recognize it from the textbook and possibly another class. Yeah. So what do I mean about that? Um, you're gonna get a question on your next assessment and then on the midterm and then on your final. Sometimes when you issue commands, you don't get a path error problem. That's one specific type of issue. Sometimes what you get instead is that you're using the wrong switch or the wrong options with the command. Okay, so what do I mean? In Windows, you're gonna use the word help. And uh, let's say that I use copy.exe, right? I wanna get help for copy.exe. Or I'll do that. I'll have a slash question mark because that's what you do in Windows. We'll have uh, copy.exe forward slash question mark. This tells me what I can do and what I can't, right? So let's pretend you're trying to work scientific computing applications in a Linux terminal and uh, it works the same in Windows, same business. You do copy slash x calc exe and I'm a hacker so I want to want to copy this malicious software only I'm using calcula uh, calc.exe calculator and I'm going to copy it into a bitmap file like test.jpg right and that's what I want to do I want to copy that file inside the other one so it disappears and now I've embedded something called alternate data it's a little more complicated than that and I'm oversimplifying but I'm just using a quick example here I try to use the copy command and I'm using the wrong option, right? So I'm gonna do this. It's gonna say the syntax of the command is incorrect. In Linux, the error is gonna be a little different, but it'll be obvious. So I'm gonna to allude to that error in a question. I'm gonna say, what command do you use to clear the error? And the answer is gonna be this, man calc.exe. Or in the Linux side, it could be, in the Linux world, it could be .bin or whatever. The point is, is that you're gonna use the, the, the command man because that's short for manual. It's gonna give you the switches you do need and because you know what the switches work now, which ones work now, you're gonna clear, you're going to clear the error. So it's a way to clear the error. I'm gonna to try to trick you. I'm gonna say which command will clear this error and I'm gonna have all sorts of other bogus crap in there. And I might throw in bogus switches. Like, oh, you're supposed to use slash X. No. Now, how do you answer that question? You better have your terminal open in PG book or in Ubuntu, right? You better when you're trying to take the assessment. It's open book, right? And I want you to know the tricks the tools of the trade. Okay, so on Thursday, we're gonna dive in and cover uh, how to structure data. And we're gonna cover the criteria and the steps to begin your solution. And by early next week, we're gonna be into our assessment. Are there any questions about what we've covered today? <laughs>